So today let's have some fire extinguisher and let's explore some induction lights. And they are huge. Here's the dog for reference and they're basically induction driven fluorescent tubes or discharge lamps. They're like fluorescent tubes with phosphor but no electrodes. They are circles and no conductor going in. My friend gave me four pieces so big thanks for the donation and now let's try to explore them. And they contain the circular fluorescent tube with two coupling rings and this big aluminium reflector and on this side here's the housing with the power supply. It says industrial light, some type number, 230 volts, 50 hertz, IP65, 200 watts, 5000 kelvins and the date of installation unfortunately not filled in. And here it says eco. And this demonstrates how quickly things are changing. Just a couple years back this was considered ecological, sustainable, environmentally friendly, green, whatever. Highly efficient, long life, energy saving. And now it's suddenly seen as some inefficient hazardous waste. Full of toxic phosphor, mercury and so on. And this demonstrates that nothing is future proof. Anything that's advertised as green nowadays can be a horrible, inefficient, dangerous, toxic, hazardous relic just a couple years later. And I tested all four of these and they are fully functional. But despite this they have been replaced with LEDs. But now let's try to disassemble one. Let's see what's inside, how does it work and what sort of voltage and frequency is it using. I guess these are really not that much less efficient than LEDs. They probably are about 80 or more lumens per watt, maybe 90 lumens per watt and this might include the power supply and its losses. But now anyway, let's try to disassemble it and see the internals. It has a glass cover here and this is basically just on one screw here. So let's unscrew it. This thing comes off and the glass should come off now. And here's the tube in it. In this one this wire is loose, in the other one it's on the back of the tube. And the tube is mounted on two screws here and it seems to have some ferrite rings around it in some aluminium covers and shieldings probably. So let's try to unscrew this and let's see. Now the tube is unscrewed and it's on just two wires going into the power supply. There is some interconnection between this ring and the other one. And they have some wire rings on them, which are probably in a series, I guess. And here is this evacuation stem of the tube, with also some amalgam pill or mercury dispenser or something. And these things really contain just a couple milligrams of mercury. It's not like this entire thing is full of mercury. It would be almost heavier than me. Now, can I somehow unscrew the rings from the tube. There is a screw basically tightening this aluminium ring around the ferrite core I guess. And when I unscrew it and the screw comes out. And there is actually more screws in it I guess. And there is also this thing which slides out revealing more screws. This is actually what holds the holder in this thing. Let's unscrew these screws. And this comes off. This comes off. And then this thing comes off. And the ferrites come off, which are two half circles. One half circle of the ferrite and the other half circle here with a winding on it. The entire thing is here twice, the other thing is identical I guess. And it actually seems the coils are not in a series, they are in parallel. Into each insulation two wires go. And the other one is disassembled and I guess there is really not that much difference in the efficiency of these ones versus LEDs, especially the Chinese ones where the light output is a bit overblown. Another ferrite with the winding. The other one has no winding on it and just completes the magnetic circuit like this. But anyway, nobody really calculates the efficiency. LEDs are just the fashion, so everything has to be replaced with LEDs. Now let's try to disassemble the power supply. It's on a force fuse here. 
And then the power supply comes of the reflector. Does this one unscrew? And of course the tube is now out and you can see there is no electrode in it. It's just a loop only inductively coupled. And this thing doesn't unscrew from the power supply. So let's try to disassemble the power supply housing. There are four screws. The housing is basically two halves. Four screws out and the cover comes off. And here is the driver or power supply in it. This has some type number, 200 watts, 90 to 300 volts. Electronic ballast for induction lamp, 200 watts. And the nominal voltage of minus the input current. Of course, if it's regulated, the higher the voltage, the lower the current should be. A very good power factor, the operating temperatures. Here the minus comes in, life, neutral, ground. And it seems to have just two wires going to the inductors. And here's the terminal block, which seems to connect the coils in a parallel. And the cable coming from the outside goes in here into a terminal block and of course a nice strain relief. Here it's grounded to this housing and also the ground goes into the power supply itself. Now let's unscrew the power supply from this housing. There are two screws and the power supply comes out. Here the lamp holder can be unscrewed and this terminal block. And the thing is thoroughly apart and the glass is actually nice. It could be repurposed for a circular glass table. Similar to this one I was given as a gift. It's basically just a circular glass with paint from underneath and this metal structure under it, which is actually held onto it just using suction cups. This is actually how a table is constructed in the 21st century. And of course my DIY vacuum fluorescent display clock which is now in operation for over 50,000 hours and still no failure. And the halves of the housing are almost identical other than this one has thread in these and there is a smaller hole than here. The same thing for easier manufacture, just drilled differently. And of course everybody's screaming I should show it in operation so let's connect my dodgy test plug to it and let's try to see it running. There was about one second delay, and then it clicked, and then it started suddenly. And of course this takes a couple minutes to warm up. It's initially a bit dimmer, and here it's running. And the warm up can actually be recorded. And of course this video is going to get bloody long, and of course I'm finally going to open the power supply, no worries. I'm connecting a solar panel to a resistor way bigger than necessary, about 10 ohms. And I'm going to use a slow rolling oscilloscope and measure the voltage on the resistor. And the resistor loads the voltage on it to a small fraction of its open circuit voltage. So the oscilloscope is going to sense the current, not the voltage. Because it's the current that goes linearly up with the illumination. The voltage goes up more like logarithmically with the illumination. To use a solar panel as a linear light sensor, you have to measure the current at the output, not the voltage. So it basically has to be loaded with quite a low impedance. Let's connect an oscilloscope probe to it, switch it to times one, because the voltage is going to be low and we don't need much bandwidth here. And here I've turned the light on and the oscilloscope's running at 20 seconds per division time bias. I stop the oscilloscope and you can see that after about two and a half minutes the brightness settles and the initial light output is more than half of the final one, which is much better than high pressure discharge lamps where the initial light output is barely a couple percent of the final one. And this actually seems to go slightly back down here. And here is one more warm up, about 50 seconds per division. I disassembled two of them and one is going to stay disassembled. And one I cleaned super thoroughly. Everything is now shiny, looking as new. And here is the dog. And this is going to be reassembled and used as a studio light. I will keep the other two and maybe in the future I might also clean them and use them. It was bloody dirty inside. Look at the seal. And now it's like brand new. And the testing time. Nice. 
reassembling this thing and the original terminal block actually has a smaller distance between the holes so it was actually mounted on just one screw the other one doesn't fit so I'm going to replace it using this one which is bigger and has the right distance between the holes And it's nicely restored or refurbished. And trying 24 frames a second instead of 50 and I can see no flicker. This light is flickerless. And plugging it into my DIY watt meter and it shows 198 watts. This one was hot, running for at least half an hour. And the other one which is cold, there was just 130 watts. And it goes up as it's warming up. And it settles at 190 watts. The third one warming up, of course I didn't catch the startup. And it settles at 196. And now of course some experiments with the internals and then opening the power supply. This one seems to run. When I plug it in there is about one second delay and then it clicks and starts. I guess there has to be some high frequency driver, several hundred kilohertz, which doesn't really need that much voltage when it's already ignited. It could be less than 100 volts for the loop, but it requires way more voltage for the ignition, I guess, and that the click. Maybe it discharges some capacitor into the coils. There are two coils, they're in parallel, and each of the coils seems to have 18 turns. The cable goes in here. This one has 18 turns, clearly. And this one is a bit strange because it has 18 turns going to the terminals but the wires going from this one actually make another two turns on this one. Is it a mistake or is it non-critical or does it have some special function? I don't know. Each end of this one actually passes once through this one. The detail of the evacuation stem here. And these coils are basically transformers where the primary is the winding and the secondary is one turn formed by this glass tube. So effectively this power supply is basically driving 18 turn coils, both in parallel and as the tube passes through the course, it effectively makes two turns. Which basically means the output of the power supply would be about nine times the voltage on the tube discharge. If it's even possible to talk about a voltage when it's a loop. There's a circular discharge with no electrodes and no beginning or end. Besides the four complete lights I got one pre-disassembled, just the tube and the power supply. And this one maybe is a bit more worn, the glass is darkened, where the ferrites were, and there is no phosphor on the glass. Is this darkened by wear? Or was it like this always? I don't know. Or maybe the glass is not dark under the phosphor. Here the pill in the stem seems to be a bit more fallen apart. Maybe this one is actually much more worn. So let's try to experiment with this one which is stripped to an absolute bare bone. Will it run with the coils in parallel without one making two passes through the other one? Each of the cores has now simply just 18 turns and they're in parallel. Let's try to test it. It clicks. It's trying to start. I guess I have the polarity wrong. The polarity of one in reference to the other. Because then the voltages induced in the tube are subtracting instead of adding. Let's change the polarity of one of the coils. Now it should be right. Now for example this terminal of the power supply enters this loop from here and this loop from here. So it basically all circulates the same direction. And plugging it in, and it runs. What if I open one of the cores when it's running? Probably a bad idea, but... Just a couple millimeters and it stops running. And when I open it very slightly, it's dimmer. Now of course everybody's interested what sort of frequency and waveform it's using. Let's put one turn on it for sensing. And let's connect an oscilloscope to it. I'm using a 100 times probe up to 2 kV because I don't know what voltage is to expect. Of course I don't think the voltage in normal operation will be so high on one turn but I'm concerned about the ignition pulse. 100 times probe. I switched it to single and here's the pulse which now looks a bit over 100 volts. Interesting. 
it's a series of damped oscillations or was the oscilloscope aliasing and it looks like it's about four divisions period and one microsecond per division so it would be about 250 kilohertz well i guess it's not discharging a capacitor into it it keeps increasing the amplitude until the lamp ignites and if it fails to ignite it probably stops running and retries once a second about and the peak voltage seems to be about 130 something volts for the ignition and now let's see it in a normal operation it's a much lower voltage it's a nice sine wave for maybe slightly flattened at the top and bottom and the peak level is just 9 volts about and 232 kilohertz and this is on one turn and the tube is basically two turns so the discharge voltage would be just about 18, 19 volts it seems low but having no voltage drop of electrodes this might actually be possible and the RMS voltage is just about barely 8 volts let's try to slightly open the gap in the ferrite it slightly moves the tops and bottoms and when I open it even more it increases the voltage and then it stops running but moving the core does not seem to change the frequency so it's not frequency modulated probably I was thinking maybe the coils have some series resonant capacitor where moving it closer to the resonance might increase the voltage but this is probably something else and the operating voltage seems to be increasing as it's warming up when it starts it's about 8.5 volts peak and 6.5 RMS and after it warmed up it's about 13 volts peak and 9.5 RMS and with the warm up also the color temperature seems to have changed initially it looked to me like a bit over 4000 kelvins now it seems to be 5000 kelvins now let's take a look at the power supplies they seem to have some date code well on this one it's missing but this one seems to say 2017 October 23 if I'm reading it right which would mean it was installed for at most six years there is not much information about this lamp but it seems to say 100,000 hours but even if it was running continuously for almost six years 24 hours a day it would be only 50,000 hours even in the worst case it was running non-stop this still has half of the life left and it also says 16,600 lumens which at 200 watts would be 83 lumens per watt which I guess is including the losses in the power supply because it's really not easy to measure the actual input of the lamp but now finally the internals of the power supply it has four screws on each side not sure which side should I open let's try this well now I noticed this one has the date code here it's the same one it's starting to open and I can see some fuse which is a good sign some over voltage metal oxide varistor probably some interference capacitor and the housing actually appears like one piece from the outside but now it turns out is actually two pieces and it should fall apart when I remove this and now it opens there is a lot of it in it and it seems nicely built with a fuse, over voltage protection, some interference suppression inductors, capacitors class X, class Y capacitors. It's grounded here. There's a bridge rectifier here and two pairs of transistors or maybe diodes. Another power component with no heat sink. There are some capacitors, two big transformers, one small transformer, another capacitor here. I guess it has to have some power factor correction because it has a good power factor. This could be interference filters, this a power factor inductor and this the output transformer maybe. And some current sensing resistors, half an ohm, two in a parallel. Let's try to see the other side of the board. For this I had to unscrew the things from the heat sinks. Everything unscrewed and it should slide out. And the other side of the board, some control chip another smaller chip, some diodes and a lot of small components, capacitors and resistors here it says electrodeless induction lamp, special electronic ballast and here's again a date code from 2017 or maybe the design date but in either case this is not older than about six years 
We will try to reverse engineer at least the partial schematic of it, the power section of it, not the control circuitry, but all the power components, without basically what drives the transistor bases or gates. And these two things are transistors, identical, probably half a bridge. There is another different transistor, and this one is actually 7, 8, 15 voltage regulator. And this one is a power diode. And yes, these are interference suppression inductors. This is a power factor correction inductor with some auxiliary windings. And I saw that this is a transformer, but it has just one winding. The other pins are just for mechanical support. And this is the gate driving transformer for the half bridge. And this transistor switch is the power factor correction inductor with this output diode going into these capacitors. And the power factor correction seems to have a control chip here, the 8 pin chip. I can't read it. And here is the control chip for the half bridge. And the power factor correction chip. And now, of course, the schematic of it. Here the mains comes in via a fuse, a metal oxide very strand, a lot of interference suppression, a bridge rectifier, and then it goes into a capacitor, but it's not a smoothing capacitor, it's just a low capacitance. Just to recouple the switching frequency, but not too smooth, the 100 Hz ripple. So there's this waveform here at this point, and then it enters the power factor correction, in a typical boost configuration. Here is the active power factor correction inductor, with its main winding here and some auxiliary windings. And this transistor switches, here is the current sensing resistor made of two in parallel, and it boosts the voltage and it goes into these smoothing capacitors. So the smoothing comes after the power factor correction. And it's a pair of 250 volt capacitors in series. And that's because the output voltage has to be always higher than the maximum peak level of the mains voltage at the input. And this says up to 300 volts. And this times 1.4 is about 420 volts. So I guess the voltage on these capacitors has to be a bit higher than this. And then the smooth voltage goes into this half bridge, made of two MOSFETs, with a gate driving transformer driving the gates. Which is a bit strange, because the control chip, according to its datasheet, would be able to drive gates of a half bridge MOSFETs directly. So I'm not sure what's the reason for the gate driving transformer. And the output of the half bridge goes via this output inductor, through some series capacitors, into the coils of the induction lamp. And there is also some combination of series resonant capacitors. I guess these are for the ignition, and they are in a series resonance with this inductor to increase the voltage to strike the lamp, and then the voltage is much lower. And I guess this capacitive divider is to sense the voltage. This goes into the control circuitry. And one of the auxiliary windings on this power factor inductor is probably for voltage sensing. And the other one seems to produce a low voltage for the chips. It's bridge rectified, smooth, and there is a 78 15 voltage regulator regulating 15 volts. And this voltage goes into the control circuitry. But because this voltage is only produced after this transistor in the power factor correction starts switching, there has to be a startup circuitry, which probably goes through here. These two resistors, via this inductor, this resistor, through the coils, this resistor, and here. This is basically the startup path through the resistors, and this capacitor charges, and then the power factor correction chip starts switching, and then it powers itself through here. Let's try to do some oscilloscope measurements. For this I'm going to run it on an isolation transformer. Will it work? It will. Now it's partially disassembled, but the components still need to be on a heat sink. Now connecting a probe between the gate and drain of the lower MOSFET in the half bridge. In the schematic it's here and here. And that's it. It's not very square, but at least when it passes through the gate threshold voltage level it's sort of steep. And there are some superimposed pulses, it seems. And for some reason on an analog oscilloscope the pulses are not there. It looks cleaner here. And the gate of the power factor correction transistor. Of course it's unstable because both the duty cycle and the frequency is varying based on the magnitude of the main voltage. It basically goes up and down with the sine wave. When I stop it, sometimes it's a lower duty cycle and over 60 kHz. Sometimes it's a higher duty cycle, now about 50%. And occasionally the frequency is below 40 kHz. Here for example the duty cycle is quite high, probably because the main was just close to the zero crossing. And here a lower duty cycle, where the mains voltage was near the peak. The high frequency switching waveform depends on at which point of the main sine wave I freeze it. 
and the analog oscilloscope is showing sort of several waveforms simultaneously because both the frequency and the duty cycle is dynamically changing. And here is the output of the half bridge, a nice square wave. And the lower MOSFET gate together with the half bridge output. And this is the gate of the power factor correction transistor and this is the bridge rectifier positive and I'm trying to synchronize two values levels of the 100 Hz ripple and you can see the switching waveform of the power factor correction changing. At a higher voltage from the bridge rectifier it's a lower duty cycle, lower frequency and at a lower voltage from the bridge rectifier it's a higher frequency and a higher duty cycle. And of course the CRT seems very dim because now it only spends very little time scanning. And on the digital oscilloscope capturing where the rectifier voltage is lower and higher, there is a lower duty cycle then. And now zooming the time base way out. And here is the 100 Hz ripple. And of course here you can see the switching frequency in comparison to this is way higher. And the power factor transistor gate and drain in reference to the source of course. And it's sort of one signal is the inversion of the other. And the gate of the lower transistor in the half bridge versus one turn on the lamp coil. When opening the ferrite core the timing seems to change. It is a different phase shift. Ferrite core completely closed, no air gap and making a gap. The phase angle changes as I change the ratio between the inductive and capacitive part of the circuit. And the power factor transistor gate versus the current sensing resistor in its source. When the transistor is on you can see the current ramping up, but there is a lot of noise superimposed, probably from the half bridge switching. Of course when the oscilloscope is not frozen it's all dynamically changing like this. And half bridge lower MOSFET gate versus the power factor transistor gate. It seems there is no synchronization between these two parts of the circuit. And when I freeze it you can see the half bridge frequency is several times higher than the power factor correction frequency. And this one trying to synchronize to the power factor correction and synchronizing to the half bridge. And once more the half bridge output and the lower MOSFET gate. Here I captured the startup after plugging it in. And it seems the initial frequency is 390 kHz. And then it's probably shifting the frequency gradually down to 230 kHz. And the voltage gradually goes up as it's moving closer to the resonance. And this was done in the single mode. Single, ready, plugging in. And the last experiment, running it on a variac at various input AC voltages measured by this. And this one measures the DC voltage coming from the power factor correction on these electrolytic capacitors. Let's increase the voltage. 14, 27 volts AC, 38, 46, 50. And it's already started, but it's dim. Increasing the voltage to about 70 volts. 80 volts. And at 80 volts the DC voltage is already full 429 volts. So the power factor correction basically doubles as a pre-regulation. And from 80 volts up the voltage stays the same on the electrolytic capacitors. And that's the variac all the way up. And reducing the voltage. And the DC voltage stays constant. 90 volts, 80 volts AC in and still the same voltage and the DC voltage starts dropping under 80 volts AC in. And now it's actually flashing. Doesn't seem to have under voltage protection. But other than that a nice power supply as well as the whole light. And of course the video got bloody long. But if you prefer this type of videos over some stupid TikTok videos or shorts, please consider subscribing, using the thanks button or supporting this channel on Patreon. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You keep this channel running.